Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining Aperture Conversations, Rediscovering the Photographs of Ernest Cole. My name is Aisha Coppin Ford, Editorial Assistant in the Books Program at Aperture, where I had the opportunity to work on the title we will discuss today, Ernest Cole, The True America. For those who may not be familiar with Aperture, we are a nonprofit publisher established in 1952 by a group of artists, writers, and curators guiding conversations around photography. Today, Aperture is a multi-platform community connecting global audiences through our acclaimed quarterly magazine, books, exhibitions, digital platforms, public programs, limited edition prints, and awards. Aperture's programs are made possibly by the generosity of our board of trustees, our members, other individuals, and in part by the New York State Legislature. Our programming series, Aperture Conversations, presents an intimate talk to photographers, designers, artists, and writers, offering new insights, novel lines of inquiry, and unique connections across disciplines. This season, Aperture has published Ernest Cole, The True America, the first publication of Ernest Cole's photographs depicting Black lives in the United States during the turbulent and eventful 1960s and early 1970s. After fleeing South Africa to publish his landmark book, House of Bondage, in 1967 on the horrors of apartheid, Cole resettled in New York. He photographed extensively on the streets of New York City and documented Black communities in cities and rural areas of the United States, traveling across the country in the months leading up to and just after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. The pictures reflect both a newfound freedom Cole experienced in America and an incisive eye for the inequalities of systemic racism. To begin today's program, I'm pleased to introduce our esteemed speakers. Joining us from Johannesburg, South Africa, Leslie Matlazane is a nephew of Ernest Cole and chairperson of the Ernest Cole Family Trust, responsible for, promote, for preserving and promoting Ernest Cole's body of work and legacy. Joining us from Chicago, Leslie M. Wilson is associate director for academic engagement and research at the Art Institute of Chicago. Her research, teaching, and curatorial endeavors focus on the history of photography, the arts of Africa and the African diaspora, modern and contemporary American art, and museum studies. She has an exhibition, David Gold Goldblatt, No Ulterior Motive, currently at the Art Institute of Chicago, co-curated with Matthew Witzkowski and Judy Dittner. She also wrote an essay for this book. Moderating the, moderating the panel is Denise Wolf, our editorial director in the books program at Aperture and editor of this title. We will be answering audience questions toward the end of the program, so please feel free to post your questions using the Q&A feature throughout the conversation. Again, thank you for joining us, and I will now pass it over to Denise and our panelists. Hi, everybody, and um, welcome. We're so happy to be talking with you today. And um, we're going to start off with uh, just a little flip through of the book to get a look, give a little bit of context about um, what this looks like as an object and some of the different sections before we get into a larger um, slide talk and, uh, and uh, conversation. So could you queue up the, the film, please? Okay, so here it is, Ernest Cole, The True America. Um, this is designed by Oliver Barstow, who's a South African uh, designer. And we open with the image that the book is named after, The True America, that appears in the graffiti behind, um, behind the uh, people in the image. Uh, the book opens with three essays, a preface by Raoul Peck, who's working on a film about Ernest Cole, and he really writes about this from the perspective of exile. Um, an essay by Leslie Wilson, who's joined us today, um, contextualizing the work uh, culturally and photographically, and an essay by James Sanders about the life of Ernest Cole. There are three sections, the one we're looking at um, right now, which is uh, on Harlem called A World in Itself. And all of these sections are named after either things that Cole wrote in his letters or that we saw in the pictures. Um, and it's funny that we start the book with Harlem because actually in the letter, Cole talks about wanting to save Harlem for last. This was a project he was working on long term, and he wanted to save it for last because it was a whole world into itself. 
Um, he had been commissioned by the Ford Foundation and received grants to document both rural and city communities in the United States. And that allowed him to travel. And that's what we're looking at right now, which is a section about his travels in the United States. These are mostly from 1968, um, as Aisha said in her introduction, in the months leading up to and just after the assassination of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. And he went everywhere. He was in Oakland, Cleveland, Detroit, LA. He was in New Mexico. He was in um, Atlanta, Memphis, Washington, DC. And often at times when things were really happening, um, this was uh, a lot of political activity. Um, the Black Panther rallies out in California. He was in Memphis for the um, sanitation worker strike. He was in Atlanta for MLK's funeral. Um, so they're extremely interesting, often traveling by car. And then the last section of the book, which we saw kind of last in that flip through, is really looking at his street work um, which is mostly in Midtown Manhattan. And we felt like this was a very different feel and project from what he was trying to do for the Ford Foundation or what he was doing in Harlem, which is also where he lived. But he traveled there regularly and really photographed the kind of juxtapositions um, and crowds coming together on the streets of New York uh, in a really classically street photographer way. And uh, Le Leslie Matlasani, you we talked about this so often of like, there's so many different types of work here, and we could have done several different books. Um, but this work really in, in the negatives um, is between 1968, maybe a little bit into 1967, and maybe some early 1972. It's a really short time frame, um, what we could see. And so we wanted to give a wider taste of what he was looking at um, during those times. Um, and so that's a little bit of an overview of the project. We'll dig into some of the details, but I thought it was such a surprising and interesting project. It's really a kind of once in a lifetime um, type of type of body of work. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about the surprise of it and people knew that he had photographed for the Ford, but most people had never seen this work. And it wasn't until it was really, it reappeared in a safe deposit box in Sweden in 2017, that it really came to light. And that was, you know, 40,000 negatives, um, many of which they weren't sorted. There was no information. And um, Leslie M, I thought, you were, I mean, you were so involved in that. You were in the room and it was a surprise to you. I wondered if you could just speak to that moment and what was that like? And what, what was, what was it like to open something like that? A kind of treasure. Uh, my name is Leslie Machaisani. I'm the nephew of NS Cole and I'm uh, also um, the head of the NS Cole Family Trust. Okay, um, taking me back to uh, April 2017, um, I, I couldn't believe uh, what we found in the safety deposit boxes. If I had to describe the feeling, you know, I could only say that it uh, feels like when a young Simba as a newborn being lifted by shaman, shaman baboon Rafiki, you know. So some 50 years uh, after our last meeting, you know, uh, in that moment, I felt so close to my uncle as I have ever been, you know. The discovery of uh, the archive was a remarkable event and, I, and has uh, blown uh, fresh wind into my sails, you know. It, it's amazing to see what he captured, you know, and how connected uh, he was to those moments. Uh, his images feel like uh, a warm invitation from someone sharing a slice of their life experience. You know, it, it, it was really amazing to you know to, to, to see you know the the first you know deposit box you know falling open. Very 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 amazing. Wow. Well. I know it was a long 
journey between that moment and putting together the book and then seeing the book for the first time. But I wondered, I wasn't there when you saw it, when it came in, like, what was that like? <laughs> oh, um, look, I mean, I was greatly impressed. You know, uh, the book is stunning. The book is amazing. You know, the quality, the arrangement of the images is what would make an school very, very happy, you know, as he was uh, meticulous about almost everything, you know. Um, not forgetting to, to mention the extremely interesting, you know, preface of the book. Uh, uh, thanks to Oliver Bateau for his thoughtful design for, for this, you know, stunning book, you know. And I know it, it meant, it was so impactful when House of Bondage was republished um, last year and, and that was kind of repatriated to South Africa. But I'm curious, what has it been like bringing this work to South Africa? Like what has the reception been or how are people responding to it? Well, uh, not as good as I expected, you know? Um, you know, uh, promoting the work has been a huge uh, challenge uh, for us in, in South Africa, as, especially for myself, because I'm still focusing on, uh, you know, bringing home the rest of NSCO, uh, you know, uh, uh, work, which is still held by various institutions, you know, especially in Europe, you know. But um, I'm, I'm positive and confident that uh, we, we're heading in the right direction. You know, as we are uh, at the same time uh, putting together concrete plans to, you know, for, for promoting his work uh, in South, uh, to the South African uh, audience, you know. But so far, um, he is still little known to most South Africans. I can assure you we have a lot of work to do. Hence, I even uh, made a point that I get more you know, uh, House of Bondage uh, books so that I can, uh, you know, distribute them to, um, you know, various uh, people in leadership positions, you know, political leaders, uh, 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 church, uh, you know, organization leaders, uh, and so on, uh, so that, you know, people that, you know, are often on the stage uh, most of the time, so that they can talk about, uh, you know, uh, the work of uh, NS Code, you know. Because it's the work is still so relevant, you know, much as South Africa has changed, but not enough, you know, you know, not enough, at, not at all. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I'd say it's the same in the United States. Ooh. It's very relevant. It yeah. hasn't changed enough. Um, coming back to that idea of surprise, I, I guess I, this is for both Leslie Wilson and Les, Leslie Malasane. I just wondered if you could talk about what surprised you most in seeing this body of work or there you know certain themes or certain pictures or the breadth of it is it my cue uh, look i was uh, i was i was i was actually not not much surprised to look at the style you know uh, as soon as um, the work was arranged into uh, themes. I, I could see an escold in in the body of work. You know, uh, uh, I could see him. You know, um, uh, 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 doing his what he's really skilled. You know, street photography at his best. You know, the the the, the images are so beautiful. You know, it, I can only see an escold in those uh, you know images. You know. Yeah, I mean, I would just add to that and just say that the quality clearly is, you know, it's sustained. It's, it's, he's a, he's a phenomenal photographer. He has a great eye. Um, you know, I think there's also a way that he moved through space and kind of managed to get close to people. And it, you know, I think we're doing a lot of unpacking of just, you know, how is he, um, kind of building relationships or getting to know certain spaces, but also just moving through and and clearly working quickly, but just so so powerfully. Um, I think my my biggest surprise was you know even though you know 
the article that appeared in the New York Times, you know, that he he did in, in 67 will speak to the Ford Foundation grant and the places he traveled to. I think that the extent of his travels, I think, Denise, to what you were saying before, too, is just really, um, it's still surprising. Um, and I think it's not just where he went, it's when he was there. Right. It's the it's the really impactful, monumental events that he was kind of traveling and passing through, you know, Los Angeles in a moment where he's, you know, in a room for a talk by, you know, Kwame Ture, then Stokely Carmichael, you know, that that he's, you know, at, you know, the sanitation worker strike in Memphis, that he's in Atlanta right after the assassination, that he's, you know, kind of in cities that are facing, you know, just moments of uprising in the wake of MLK's assassination, that he's really, he, to arrive so soon in a, in a space and it feels like he has his finger on the pulse, like he knows where to be. Um, that was really just such a revelation. Um, and it's such a complex and far ranging look at, at Black America, at race relations that he offers too. It's definitely not one trajectory. We're looking at Garveyites. We're, we're looking at kind of different threads of Black nationalism. We're looking at, um, you know, different industries, different um, communities, uh, different religions. Different. It, it just, it's such a vast array. Um, and I think that is something so exciting to, to be immersed in. And then I guess I'll just say the color, the color work is just an app, like, you know, and that it isn't just, um, oh, okay, well, we're looking at Harlem or we're looking at Midtown and, it, and it's color. It's that he, it's so beautifully observed. Um, and it just takes you into the sense that just Harlem was just always so fashionable, but it was just on fire. It was alive. It was colorful. And I think it's really just so exciting to see that work. Yes, exactly. It's all of those things that almost every single thing about it was surprising. Um, I wanted to come to the title a little bit. And as we were going through this, it was a real struggle to come up with a title because everything that we came up with felt like we were putting it like an overlay over Ernest Cole. And we had no idea what he would have called it. And so we were on a you know a media Zoom meeting, and Leslie Matlasani, it was you who said, "Let's call it the True America," because of the the picture that has the True America in the in the background. And you didn't know this, but at the same time, Leslie Wilson had just turned in her essay, and her essay was titled at that point "The True America." And so there was this incredible synergy around the title. And I think it's interesting to think about it. Why is it such a strong title? But also like hearing you talk about what surprised you and all these different threads and strands, like what was the true America? Or well, how was he trying to make sense of that? So I wonder if, if um, either one of you or both of you could speak to that title. Well, uh, looking at, at the work, Yeah, I mean, I think drawing something from the work really made sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I was drawn to that because it identifies again another one of the threads I think that is so impactful in in Ernest's work, which is his eye for text in the landscape and for visual irony, um, you know, for for juxtaposition that like he he sees so well, um, and so you know, there's this graffiti on the wall and you know it, it, this arrangement of men and someone's reading and it just you know it, it feels like you know who who wrote this and was in a kind of assertion that like Harlem is the site of the true America or you know it's 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 a bold claim um and it feels like something that I think Cole was trying to wrap his brain around kind of what what that was and so it was less that I think I was thinking of you know, this book is like offering the true America. It was more that the true America is something to search for. It's something to make. It's something in formation um, that it's 
the, you know, at the same time that I think that there are truths about America that do come through the photographs. Um, and, and, and that I think is it, again, very, very powerful, but yes, the universal exterminator um, sign next to the sign that life can be beautiful and well worth living is just, I think it's just, it's, it's so genius. Um, and, you know, and the, the signs in the window and the, you know, and, and, and that it, there's just so much and so many layers. Um, he's an eye for ads, you know, and like the, you know, Pepsi or, you know, kind of this, you know, hair sheen or the, like that all of these things are alive in the work and that realm of commerce and of, of you know, advertising, but also people's interventions where they're kind of, you know, spray painting by black, you know, onto the walls of buildings and in Harlem. Um, that that's all alive in there. And so I, I just, I loved this idea of the true America as something that he was in search of. That's really beautifully put this. And this idea of searching is something you talk about um, in the in the essay, uh, especially about how that was something that you saw as slightly different from maybe what was going on in House of Bondage, there was this exploratory character and this idea of searching for himself and this idea of, of true America or him, what he meant outside of South Africa. So I wonder if you could, you know, dig in a little bit there. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard because the projects are, you know, they're, so, they're closely connected, but they're also so, so different. Um, you know, and, and actually there were some moments that I really love where you can actually see um, inside of the window of the African National Memorial Bookstore, you can see a copy of the book House of Bondage in the window. And, you know, like, you know, his that project is there and it's alive, um, you know, but that was a project that was so guided by 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 research um, and and a really kind of tight structure, right? You know, like the it's fourteen chapters in you know in the original House of Bondage, and um, and he one of the revelations also of the kind of refining this material in the archives was also his papers and his notes and all of the other stuff that comes with his thinking behind the projects, and he's he's writing so intentionally in support of House of Bondage, and um, I think he's definitely working in a way with the American work where he does have kind of like a call sheet, you know, there, there are things he's looking for. Um, but I think it's both research and instinct. Um, you know, that, that he's, he's moving through and um, kind of ready to, you know, photograph bookstores. He's, he's looking at readers. He loves readers, <laughs> people who are carrying magazines. And, and I think also he was a magazine man um, and he's interested in books and he's interested in the things that people are, um, are reading, you know, kind of how are they coming and arriving at their ideas? Um, you know, he's also, you know, he's looking at leaders, you know, local leaders, but he's also looking at people who are struggling, um, I think he offers a really robust view of, of people. And I think also there's something that Alf Kumalo kind of mentions, um, kind of, this is a friend of his a photographer from South Africa who'd visited him in New York at one point, um, you know, that, that Ernest had, you know, in a moment of frustration in New York kind of said, you know, is this the America of Ebony? And that phrase has, you know, it's it's one I've thought about a lot in terms of you know, how were kind of the kind of a broader kind of African like population, a broader African diasporic population, also coming to understand America through magazines and through books, and then for Ernest to kind of maybe have ideas about America that he's bringing with him, and then confronting the reality of life in America, and those layers of experience are things that I really think. Um, you know, are exciting to see here. Um, and as much as he is kind of certainly focused on Black experience in the States, I think the work in Midtown also shows that he is, his, his view um, and his focus is much broader too. I mean, he's really looking at everyone. Um, and he's, I think he's just curious about people. He's curious about the world. Um, and it really, really comes through. I love this idea of, of that contrast between Ebony and what he's seeing there. And 
also like that's something that he probably encountered before he arrived was a certain picture of what the United States um, was or looked like. And he's countering that. And maybe it was the magazine. And I'm also curious, like, especially from you, Leslie Matlasane, like what do you see something particularly South African in his eye um, that that maybe we might have missed in, in the US? Like, is there something from your perspective that that seems particular um, to South Africa? Yeah, look, I mean, uh, um, if you look at uh, the um, body of work in uh, the US body of work, I mean, you know, there are some sim similarities between uh, what he was documenting in South Africa and and partly what uh, he was actually documenting in the U.S., but uh, in in the U.S., he he had a a greater an advantage, a greater freedom to you know get closer to the people, unlike in in, in South Africa where he had to take uh, a risk, you know, uh, risk his life, you know, documenting uh, you know some of uh, the, the the subjects uh, 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 and. Uh, um, uh, yeah, the, the, that's uh, actually uh, something that I noticed that he was actually part of the people. He, you know, s s in most cases you could see that they, they are actually looking at him, taking photographing them. Unlike in in in, in South Africa, where most of the the images he was actually taking people from behind. You know, most of the the images, the majority of the images, people from behind. Unlike uh, you know, in the in the U.S., where he had an advantage, you know, uh, to get closer to the people, to be part of uh, you know the, the the community that he was actually photographing. You know. I hadn't thought of that. Um, that's a really interesting perspective. Do you uh, do you did you that something you saw as well, Leslie Wilson? Uh, it it definitely was. Yes, I mean, I think it's I think. You know, Leslie, what you're saying about the risk taking, I think, you know, there, there's still risks in the States, but it is different. It is different. Um, and a lot of the, you know, in House of Bondage, Ernest is photographing, um, you know, people who are being stopped by the police for kind of to produce their their passbooks. Um, and he can't be doing that close to them. You know, some of those are kind of like at an angle, he's photographing from above, he's across the street. Um, you, you can tell that he's kind of working rather surreptitiously to be able to make those photographs. And I think he can be so much more present in this work. Um, and, and that is a real difference, um, you know, at the same time that I think, you know, actually this photograph that has come up here from Cleveland, we do see him playing still though with, you know, vantage points. And I love, I, you know, I think so many photographers love a, a, a side mirror or a rear view mirror, <laughs> you know, to kind of give us those multiple perspectives and, you know, reflections. And, um, you know, so you see him playing with, with all of that. And I think in Midtown, we get a little bit more of that surreptitious way of working as a, as a street photographer. Um, but I, but I do think that the risk, the profile of risk, um, really shapes the projects very differently. Although coming to that idea and also touching on the idea of both road trip and street, because these are huge genres within photography, and you touch on that a little bit in the essay. Um, I also, too, like really was drawn to that picture where you can see he's in a car. And that mm. is that's a specific genre, but it's also driving while black in the United States is is not safe. And so... I was curious if you could talk a little bit about that it's it's pretty incredible that he was working in this road trip genre, but also like a, what does it mean that he's working in street? Like how does he contextualize within those histories as well? Yeah, I mean, I think this is this is one of those areas that I'm, you know, really looking forward to all of the research that's gonna that's gonna <laughs> You know, shake out from this project to really understand how he's traveling through certain certain spaces, but we can definitely see him moving through spaces. You know, um, traveling by car, it's hard to tell, but it you know in certain certain photos it's indicated he's not traveling alone. So I'm really curious about who he might have been traveling with, how that might have shaped you know access to certain spaces or you know um, entry points. Um, but it's, you know, the, the road is not that open depending on who you are. And, you know, and I think it's, uh, it can always be challenging, but I think, 
you know, this is one of those things if we're talking about what hasn't changed enough, it is still kind of, you know, a dangerous road to take as, you know, as, as a black man um, kind of driving around America. Um, and so, you know, there is a real, it's interesting to see those moments when he's inside of the car or outside, you know, to try to get a sense of how he's moving through space, if he's moving quickly through particular towns. Um, I want to know so much more about what he would, you know, this is that thing of wanting to understand the book that he was imagining he would make, because I, that's one of those things I would love to hear or understand is what he thought of the road. You know, I think we got some indication of it here, but, but the, the poetry of the road is often kind of what we, we long to kind of understand from from a photographer but yeah a photograph like the one that we just were looking at um from cleveland um you know in the new libya headquarters um that there's a sense that he's just far enough away and i think there are a few photographs surrounding this in the contact sheet that really clearly indicate that he's i think seated in a car for this one um so it's you know how that seems like another way to work a little bit surreptitiously <laughs> Um, and to kind of see and observe um, from the road, but kind of move around more more freely. So, I, in, in in some ways, there's a, like I think a little bit of alignment and kind of what the car might be able to make possible, and the kind of work he's doing on the street too. Well, and I think you bring up a good point that this is the beginning, um, and. I think we all hope on the line that in publishing this this um, body of work and this research um, and scholarship on it, that others will pick it up and take it because there are so many things that we just didn't know. You know, there was no real information with these um, negatives. We don't know exactly why he was in all these places or exactly how he felt about it. Um, and he was definitely... He did not want to be misquoted uh, when he had answered the New York Times. They had said that he had feared being lynched in the South. And he said, no, I feared being shot. Um, so I feel like he was very had very particular ideas. So if we ever, if anyone who traveled with him or knew him, um, we're definitely interested in finding out more. And if please contact us because uh, there's more to the story that we don't know. And that's also part of what's so fascinating about it are these kind of gaps. Um, Leslie, do you have anything to add seeing, seeing the travel? I know that was something we went round and round about, well, like whether to include some of the road trip work or not include the road trip work in the, in the book. And in the end, I, I mean, I'm glad that we did. I felt like it was really important to see it. It, 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 it was a very uh, good idea, obviously, to, you know, uh, identify, you know, the, the images according to, to uh, uh, different uh, locations and uh, also to arrange it, uh, uh, you know, according to the location so that we can, uh, you know, have a clue as to exactly, you know, uh, how he was actually uh, photographing, you know, so... Yes, it was. I think it was a good idea to do that. You know, and much as we we don't have uh, any clues as to why he was doing that, uh, but hopefully, you know, with deeper research, uh, we might come across some information. As as you know, we 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 are still looking for for more information about his uh, his archive. You know, just recently we did uh, more research. Uh, 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 with uh, Rune Hasna's uh, archive at the uh, Royal, Royal Library in Stockholm. And then we found uh, other clues, you know, uh, about an uh, uh, archive, letters, uh, uh, some few uh, uh, vintage prints amongst the Rune Hasna's uh, archive, uh, some correspondence between, uh, you know, uh, 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 him and Rune Hasna regarding his archive, you know, and hopefully one day we will get some clues. Uh, so um, just uh, hopefully by next month, I will have the opportunity to go and collect uh, 
the other remaining uh, archive at the Hasselblad uh, uh, Foundation in Gothenburg. Uh, and there is uh, also some books and uh, stacks of magazines. As you know, he was collecting lots of magazines and even the magaz magazines that uh, we found uh, 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 at the bank, you know, you could see he was photographing, ac ac you know, according to what he was actually researching, you know, uh, uh, in those uh, specific uh, magazines. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll get some clues, you know, but at this stage, we don't have uh, real clues as to why he was uh, uh, on the road, you know. Well, Maybe he wanted Leslie to Wilson. know more about America, we, you know, uh, that could be a possibility. Indeed, but Leslie Wilson, I wanted to come back to you because I know this is something that we had talked a lot about. You touched on magazines a little bit, but I know that you were very fascinated by those magazines that are in the archive, especially ones that had his notes on it or it was clear he had saved. I wondered if you could touch on what you were seeing there and, and how you see that in the work. Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, I think Ernest Cole is like an archivist's dream in a way, because he would rip out the pages of magazines that he, like the pages he wasn't interested in, he'd pull those out. So you knew what he was reading for, like you knew what he was interested in, and he was annotating in the magazines, and uh, and sometimes arguing with them, you know, not, not infrequently, like refuting uh, what he was finding inside of them. Um, and so, you know, it was clear that he was, you know, really interested in interracial relationships, um, like romantic relationships, like that was something that he had, you know, collected and magazines, actually not just American ones, you know, from, from around the world, like German magazine, Praline, um, and, you know, and so I was looking there and then kind of looking through the photographs and saying, oh my gosh, I can see that this is something that he's looking for and he's trying to kind of understand and document um, a kind of more permissive um, structure around um, interracial relationships in the States. Um, I think it's also interesting to see, uh, you know, there was a Life magazine uh, spread by Gordon Parks that he definitely highlights and kind of is is, is looking at. And I, that's one, again, one of those moments I'm so curious to know what he thought of that, of that spread and how that might have informed um, how he was photographing members of the Black Panthers or spending time with them. Um, so I think there's a real, you know, you, you can see the research that he's putting in along the way um, and that he's reading so broadly um, and really thinking about then what do I want to produce? What do I want to make? Um, what kind of book could this be? You know, and I think, again, I, probably not one book. And I think even in producing this book, like, it's so clear that it's not, you know, it's not one book. It's, it's, there, there's so many ways to really think about how to organize um, the material that he's, that he's bringing together here. Um, I also love some of the photographs of like newsstands that he, that he makes, and it really sends you back into that particular moment. Um, it, it helps us pin down and date some of these photographs too. So, so again, I'm, I'm grateful for it on that practical level, but then also, um, you know, it's, it's clear that he, um, you know, is, is thinking about how this work fits in that broad landscape of, of, of printed matter. Yeah, and so I know you're going to be excited to see whatever new material comes back to the archive. Um, that's really exciting. Um, I thought we might touch a little bit on another surprise in the work is seeing some of the photographers and people that he was running into and were visiting him. I mean, we don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but I feel like... Um, a lot of how Ernest Cole is portrayed um, prior to this moment is as a loner, and, and I don't want to take away from that either, but as this kind of solitary figure. Um, and so it was really um, heartening to see that, especially on, on the streets, he was running into photographers and people and, and poets that, that he knew and who clearly knew him. Um, and then people were were visiting him and they were photographing together. And so this was um, 
Uh, and that's Kwame Brathwaite and the, you know, so there's, there's a community here, at least on the, on the streets and photographing that he's encountering and, and part of. And so I wondered if, you know, e either one of you could talk about this or um, speak to it in some way. Yeah, I, I'll just say I I love these photos because they there were it feels like he's in dialogue, like he's in the mix. He's not just an observer, like he's spending time with um with friends um and with the community of, of photographers. So yes, in the the lower left, we can see Kwame Brothwaite um kind of probably, you know, with with a Grandasa model, um, and that, you know, there's a way that he that that Ernest Cole is clearly connected with this kind of circle of Black is Beautiful movement. Um, he's also um, clearly connected to photographers from the Kamoinge, um workshop and, you know, Sean Walker Ray, and Ray Francis are, are seen here, but one can imagine that network is also probably quite a bit larger. Um, you know, I think it's it's, you know, it also is really touching to see Alf Kamala's visit and, you know, and, and Cole actually makes multiple photographs of, of, of Alf on that visit. Um, you know, in the upper left, I was really excited to see Ted Jones and, um, you know, poet, artist, um, you know, just a really exciting figure who connects so many different artists. And so the sense that Ernest's network is really broad um, came through, I think, uh, you know, he's spending time at the African National Memorial Bookstore. He has photographs of Louis Michaud. Um, and, and I think it's also clear that there's a kind of, you know, the, the intellectual hub um, of, of Harlem is a, is a space that he's, he's very much um, a part of. Um, but then there are also, you know, there, there's a photograph of W. Eugene Smith and, you know, and the kind of revelation that, you know, W. Eugene Smith and Ernst Haas are writing some of the letters on behalf of Ernest, you know, and his visa applications and, and things like that. And so um, there's a really, you know, broad network of photographers, you know, the international network of photographers that he's part of, but definitely one that's very um, anchored in Harlem too. Yeah. Yeah, and, and Leslie Matlasane, I know um, a number of people visited, and had you heard you know stories about that, or people talked about what his life was like or community was like in in New York? Yeah, look, I mean, we you know we uh, quite a number of people visited him. Rashid Lombard uh, was one of the people of Kumalo. Um, we also spent some time with uh, NS Cole there, uh, especially Rashid. And um, there, there was also um, um, uh, the late uh, Gora Petri, Kosi Zile, um, also visited him. Uh, um, um, uh, Dr. Mongani Walis Rote as well, spent some time with uh, NS Cole. Uh, uh, um, Dr. Cyril Canilo obviously was the closest uh, person uh, that uh, Ernest Cole uh, spent most of his time with, especially uh, before he passed on. Uh, he he was actually uh, responsible for actually um, welcoming my grandmother and my aunt when they um, came to New York to see Ernest Cole uh, while he was sick. Uh, yeah, so those are some of the people. Botsabe Eloya is also one guy that I remember uh, also visiting in a school. Uh, we also spoke about him a lot. Um, yeah, those are some of the few people that I could actually remember uh, from South Africa. Um, I know we're getting close to the end and we're going to take some questions, but Leslie, um, I wondered... Yeah. If you could say a little bit about what you have upcoming in terms of plans I, or talk a little bit about the film that's coming out, um, if you just want to touch on that so people know what's upcoming. Okay, um, uh, regarding um, the NSCO documentary, I think the name is uh, Lost and Found. Uh, I think you must have seen the uh, latest uh, Articles in uh, in in New York uh, where um, uh, 
Lakit uh, Stanfield agreed to be the voice of an escort uh, in the film. Uh, just recently, I uh, had the opportunity to uh, visit uh, Paris to for for an exclusive uh, screening of uh, of the film. Um, I must say, I was uh, uh, impressed uh, beyond my expectations. Um, you know, it was quite uh, moving to to watch it. So yeah, um, I'm looking forward. Uh, to sing it hopefully before the end of the year, the film will premiere according to uh, the plans. Um, yeah, so the film is almost done as we speak right now. Just uh, finalizing uh, some few couple of things, but almost done. Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, yeah, regarding uh, uh, touring exhibitions, um, a bit quiet at the moment, but there's one coming at the, uh, I think it's called the Photography Gallery in the UK. Um, it's coming uh, uh, towards the end of uh, 2024, uh, organized by Maxili uh, Andre uh, uh, at uh, Magnum uh, Paris. Uh, so yeah, um, that's one exhibition. I'm also talking to uh, Zeiss Mocha in South Africa to see if we can uh, now start uh, planning touring exhibitions uh, for South Africa. But uh, obviously the idea here is to ensure that uh, we include both uh, South Africa and American work side by side. And then uh, we hopefully the film will also, uh, you know, be on the screens by that time so that we can, you know, uh, promote his work uh, almost everywhere, you know, and also I uh, hope uh, we'll be able to sell more through America books in South Africa at the time, uh, as well as uh, House of Bondage. Yeah, so uh, th those are some of the upcoming uh, events at the moment. Well, Mark Seeley wrote a little note in the chat. He says hello to everyone. And he just says like, it's it, it's this June, it's at the Photographer's Gallery, it will be House of Bondage. And then he's put together a show uh, for autographs. So there's that. And I just wanted to mention that Aperture is also putting together um, an exhibition for North America on the United States work that Leslie Wilson will be um, curating. So we've got some exciting things in the work to, uh, in the works to continue to, elevate this um, Ernest Cole's uh, career. And so people really get the word out about um, his work. Um, I thought I would read a few questions or if pe as people have questions, please um, continue to put them in the chat. Um, someone asked, how did you know, wait a minute. Um, how did you know where the pictures were taken when the negatives have no notes with them? I thought I would address that because that's a really behind the scenes question. And it was a significant um, challenge because there are no notes and these were not organized in any way. There were the, you know, negatives were in all kinds of order. And so it really meant that a team of, um, you know, five of us looked at every picture in the contact sheets um and try to place where they were and sometimes it meant just like overlaying like is that Atlanta in the background or is that Memphis you know just like really trying to figure out like which were which places some things were obvious um like the Memphis sanitation worker strike um and then once we kind of identified like well where is New Libya that was specific to Cleveland and then this house is in Cleveland you know, see we were looking at really, really, really detailed things. Um, often like, what are the dates on the magazines? Where is this monument? And then that like illuminates where the contact sheet is. And then we can place other contact sheets. So it was a massive operation of trying to figure out um, exactly where they were and this specific rally and that's in Oakland. And so um, that took up a lot of time. And so, that's really how it came together um, and we figured out a lot and it, and it was fascinating and it took us a long time, especially in the rural South to realize like, oh, it, actually a lot of these were taken in Lowndes County, Alabama, which is a really um, politically active and important um, place in the United States as well. And so 
I don't know if that answers, but that that's how we um that's how we ended up figuring out where things were. And I think when it's New York, it's a little bit easier where you can see the neighborhood. Um, I hope we didn't get anything out of place. Uh, but um it, it was it was a challenge and a, and it, there's still work to do and there's still things we don't know. And so I want to continue to just state that. Um, I hope other people look deeply into these places and, and many people in the pictures are alive. Uh, if you see yourself, you see a member of your family, we'd love to know about that and be, be able to identify specific places um, and, and families. Anything either of you want to add? <laughs> I mean, I, I think one of the things has also just been, you know, looking through and sharing with people who we who we imagine might know, you know, kind of identifying the photographers yeah. who you're spending time with has been really exciting or, or artists. I think I I really almost lost it when I saw Ted Jones and I was like, this is so exciting <laughs> um, because it is just, you know, and just a, just a world of, of people that he knew. His network was so extensive um, that it's a lot to put this back together, but also really exciting. Someone asked, was Ernest Cole required to provide reports on his work to the Ford Foundation? No, not really. I mean, it definitely seems like he corresponded and put together budgets, but there's no pictures at the Ford. He he didn't have to file something like that with them. And that, as far as we can tell, doesn't exist or was not made available to us. I think he he had conversations back with Ford. It's kind of, I think, re reporting on the work that he was doing, but I, I don't know that he was really filing on the work that he was that he was making as he was going. Let's see, did Ernest Cole ha get in inspiration or influence from the Americans? What do you think? From Robert yeah. Frank, the Americans. Yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a really interesting question because the timing would, you know, certainly make that, it, it's quite likely he spent time looking at it. Um, I, I would say, I one can't say for sure, but he loved photo books. <laughs> And looked at looked at a lot of them, and you know, and and I think it's been much discussed that you know, his his encounters with Henri Cartier-Bresson's People of Moscow was really really significant for him to kind of say, I want to move up to the side of magazines where editors kind of tell you mm -hmm. <laughs> might might be bossing you around to having more control and and making books. Um, so I I would anticipate that he would have definitely spent time with it, but I don't know that we really have information about the extent to which that that shaped then the way that he approached his his project. Let's see. Did were there contact sheets or only negatives in the safe deposit box? I mean, Leslie, Matt Lasane, correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was mostly almost all negatives and the contact sheets we were looking at were made by Magna later. Is that right? Do you remember? Uh, there were no contact sheets on the, for, for, for the American uh, body of work. There's only negatives. Yeah. The contact sheets were made by Magnum. Absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. After the fact. And then um, there were a few because there were there were contact sheets of House of Bondage, and what was interesting was it showed his um, marks on them. So he had marked in grease pencil which ones he really um, uh, was looking at and identified for printing. And there were maybe a, a dozen of those for the United States. Um, yeah, but yeah, very very few. Out of, sheets. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Out of like thousands of contact sheets, there were maybe ten or twelve. Um, and yeah, correct. the slide film, so the, the color was all shot on um, color slide, and some of them were still in the mount, and others were just loose slide film. But you could see, what was interesting, you could see the date stamped on the slide film. And so I, I know that sounds like such a small detail, but it was some of these details that 
um, were really helpful uh, in, in putting it together. So almost all of the slide film was from 1969. And, and what we're seeing is in everything. There could have been more, you know, it, it, we don't know um, what else he photographed and why this set of things is, is in the safe deposit box. And a few people asked about, you know, how it got there and what it was doing there. And, and that's also a great mystery. You don't, we don't know. Um, that's still a mystery. Mm. Um, how did his archive end up in Sweden? Like I said, we don't know all the answers, but I think we didn't really touch on this. He did travel um, back and forth to Sweden extensively, especially between like 1970, 1969, 1971. He, he spent a lot of time in Sweden, um, had friends there, photographed there, and that he was instrumental because they were able to offer him um, a passport for a stateless person. So he became banned. He had a green card in the United States, but he did not have a passport. And so that was something that uh, Scandinavia could offer him. And one of the reasons he was going back and forth. Um, so that is also why that a Swedish safe deposit box isn't, you know, so it, it, it is still a big mystery, but it's not, um, it's not unconnected to him. Mm -hmm. Did Cole process and print his black and white film? I don't know the exact answer to that, but I know that um, a lot of the film was film that he hand rolled. Um, and so I think there was a chance he processed that. And there are in his letters notes about having other people print it. And so I don't know how much he printed and how much others, but it seemed like a kind of combination. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Had he ever mentioned the existence of the negatives? Yeah, I think there were some mentions of it. Mm -hmm. Oops, I think we're hitting, um, we're hitting two o'clock, uh, two o'clock, yeah. so we're coming to the end and I feel like there are um, so many things we don't know. And so I just wanna continue to impress on um, that idea to please like reach out to any of us with with information you might have or things you might know or recognize in the pictures. And are there any parting words from um, either one of you, Leslie Wilson or Leslie Matlasane, um, to impart to our audience? I mean, I, I'll just say, I mean, I think this book is really exciting. I, I found myself from a very personal place that I could, the late 60s are when my parents moved to the States from Jamaica. And I think that that story of you know, people finding their way in New York and, and finding and, and learning and understanding what it means to be Black in America is the journey that I feel like I'm spending time in this book and really seeing. And sometimes I think I might see my mom, <laughs> you know, like, or that, you know, she, she, she can show up here. So, I mean, I think there's something just so beautiful about discovering this. And there's also something, you know, it's, Exile clearly took its toll, you know, and I and I think there's also the the difficulty of this time that's that's in the book too, and so I think it's a really poignant project, and and I'm just excited to continue to learn more about it. Anything to add, Leslie Matlasane? I lost I lost you there again. Yeah. My my internet is, uh, I don't know whether you can hear me. It's so unstable now. I can hear you, but I feel like Leslie Wilson gave us a lovely wrap up um, yes. about this project and a great place to end this talk. And I thank everyone for attending and both of you for um, all of your work and, and thought uh, on this particular project and may it be the beginning of many more things. So yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.